Good morning, CIPC and everybody joining us by video. So glad you're with us today and uh, got a great uh, message today. Uh, we're in the book of John. We're going to be talking about feeding the 5,000 today and looking at that sign. And uh, let me share first a few announcements with you and then we'll get into the word. Uh, first, in Morocco, we're still on uh, video services and looks like we will be for a few more weeks. And we don't know what things are, are going on. We know that restrictions have gotten tighter in Casablanca, so uh, I don't see us returning to uh, services you know, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, I think they're going to look at things on uh, September the 14th if they're gonna begin loosening restrictions. So anyway, keep praying. Uh, keep praying for CIPC, MIPC, TIPC. Keep praying for us. We hope to be returning to Morocco soon. We're watching the news. We get a lot of conflicting stories. One story seems to think we're tightening down. Another story says they're kind of opening up for tourism. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. But uh, I'm very hopeful that we can be back with you very soon and that we can start some kind of church service. So uh, again, be praying for that. Kids Church. So right after this, be sure to check out Kids Church. Carol's doing messages on Moses and she goes down by uh, the river to put the little baby Moses in the river. So you'll want to see that. So gather your kids around the, the TV or the, the computer or your phone, whatever you guys are watching on and let the kids uh, watch the video with Sister Carol and they'll have a great time. And as a family, give you guys something to talk about. So always talk about the sermon. Always talk about uh, the kids' church. It's a great way as a family to worship the Lord and grow in God together. Uh, worship links. I put a couple worship links for you. One of them by Phil Wickman. It's not necessarily, he's not worship leader as much as kind of a pop song, but really good song. Uh, Battle Belongs. And of course, we know the battle belongs to the Lord. And some of us right now are facing a battle. Obviously, we all are with COVID-19, but some more than others. So uh, let that song encourage you and strengthen you. And then our CIPC worship team, I mentioned it last week in my WhatsApp, but I'd already pre-recorded the sermon, so I couldn't say anything. So we'll put a link to that again this week uh, of the CIPC worship team. They got together and were able to practice uh, the sound quality, not great because it's recorded with a device in the room and obviously there's a lot of uh, just, um, I don't know what you call that, space and so it creates, you know, echoey sound or whatever. But the uh, the team, it's so good to see them and so everybody on the CIPC worship team, thanks for taking time that day and putting a song together for us. So check out that song. I think you really just enjoy seeing our team and uh, sing the song with them, worship the Lord together. And uh, hopefully we're going to be back together very soon and be able to uh, indeed worship together. Uh, giving. So we are in the book of Proverbs and we're going through that uh, just chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but not reading all the verses, looking at those that focus on your finances. So for two weeks we've been in chapter 6 and then chapter 7 deals all with adultery. And I dealt with that a few weeks back when we were in chapter 5 about how adultery and sexual immorality will really harm your finances. And so you can find that in Proverbs chapter 5. That's what we read last time. So I'm not going to do that again. But I encourage you to go there and read Proverbs chapter 7 and see uh, that sexual immorality is so destructive for you. And, and so uh, make sure that area of your life is right. Amen. Get it right before the Lord. If it's not, then repent, give it to the Lord and get it right. Amen. Because not only is it blessing to your body, to your spirituality, but it's blessing to your finances too. And so you'll see that in those chapters. Well, today we want to look at chapter 8 in Proverbs. And I'm going to read a passage to you here from verses 12 to 21. And then we'll come back just make a couple comments. And so this passage is about wisdom. And we've talked about that before also, how wisdom connects to our finances and that wisdom means the ability to make right decisions. And in the book of Proverbs, it likens wisdom to a person, to a woman. And so it says we need to invite this woman uh, into our lives. Now, it's not a real woman and this isn't, uh, you know, like conjuring up somebody from the dead or something or bringing somebody into your life, some kind of spirit. Um, but it's about accepting wisdom and seeking wisdom and wanting wisdom in your life. So let's read this in Proverbs 8, verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogance in the evil way. And the perverted mouth I hate. Wow. 
You ever say anything perverted? Uh, Proverbs says wisdom, which, you know, that is the Lord and the Holy Spirit, but it says he hates that. Verse 14, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. Power is mine. Wow. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who judge rightly. Look at this verse, verse 17. I love those who love me. Do you love wisdom? If you love wisdom, wisdom will love you back. I love those who love me and those who diligently seek me, find me. Are you diligently seeking wisdom? Verse 18. Riches and honor are with me. You want riches and honor? Find wisdom. Enduring wealth and righteousness. How many of you know so much wealth isn't enduring? You know, all you have to do is watch people's lives. They get wealthy and then they become poor, right? They lose it all. Look at how many famous and wealthy people end up filing bankruptcy. But no, this says enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit, that's the fruit of wisdom, is better than gold, even pure gold. And my yield than the choicest silver. I walk in the way of righteousness in the midst of the path of justice. So you want wisdom? Walk in the way of righteousness and justice. And then our last verse, verse 21. To endow those who love me with wealth, that I may fill their treasures. Let's read those last two verses again, 2021. 20, I walk in the way of righteousness in the midst of the path of justice to endow those who love me with wealth that I may fill their treasuries. So, uh, the scripture there tells us, right there, if you wanna prosper, you wanna be blessed, you need wisdom, amen? Get wisdom. Twice in that verse, it talked about loving wisdom and one time about diligently seeking after wisdom. So, you want your finances blessed? Seek wisdom. And we know in the book of James, it says, anytime you lack wisdom, ask of the Lord. So wisdom comes from him, he imparts it to you. And so ask the Lord for it and believe for it. All right, let's get into our message today. So turn off your phone unless you're watching by phone. Get rid of any distractions. Get you a cup of coffee if you like. And let's get into the Word. Today we are in the Gospel of John. We're looking at the seven signs that are in the Gospel of John. And today we find ourselves in John chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at... The feeding of the 5,000. So let's go, let's open with John 6, verses 8 and 9, and then we'll pray. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fishes. But what are these for so many people? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you again that we can gather together through this video means. And God, we pray once again that very soon you would bring us together to meet in person and be able to worship you together, hear your word together, fellowship together, encourage one another together, pray for one another together. And so, Father, we long for that day when you will restore that to the church. In the time being, Lord, would you strengthen all of those uh, who are part of CIPC and all of those who are watching by video. Lord, as we get into your word today, bless the preaching of your word, open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. All right, thank you. Well, our title today is from our text, Five Loaves and Two Fish. And uh, again, we're in this series on seven signs, and I want to encourage you to read the whole Gospel of John and mark those seven signs in your Bible, but read the whole Gospel of John uh, as we do this study so that you fit those signs into context of everything else going on. We saw in our first message that John wrote these seven signs for a particular reason. So the other Gospel writers wrote about Jesus' life and recorded many miracles. John picked out seven for a very specific purpose. And we found that in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And so let's read those verses again. It says, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. In other words, John's goal wasn't to try and record every miracle that Jesus wrote. And then the next verse says, But these, these seven that John selected, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Somebody say, Hallelujah. The Son of God. 
and that believing you may have life in his name. And so that's the goal of our series as we go through these seven signs is that your faith would increase and that as your faith increases, your life would increase. For Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And that's our desire for you is that you have the abundant life that Jesus has planned for you. So let's go over our seven signs. We'll put them up there on the screen. And uh, we've already covered the, the first three. This is our fifth message, but our fourth sign. So we've already covered water to wine, healing of the nobleman's son, healing of the man at the pool, today feeding of the 5,000, and then next week will be Jesus walking on water, and then the healing of the man who was born blind and Lazarus being raised from the dead. So we'll be covering all of those in this series. And so stay with us. If you've missed any of these, go to our YouTube channel and uh, find the ones you've missed and watch those and get caught up. All right, so let's review them real quick. We said in this series that every time Jesus performed one of these signs that John's highlighting, John is highlighting it to show Jesus is master over certain things. So that again, you can see Jesus is master of all, that he is creator and sustainer, that he is God himself, so that you would be able to put your faith in him. Or for those of you already following Jesus, that your faith would increase uh, as you see these seven signs and as you see Jesus is master over everything, so that you can know that he's master over your life and that he's master over the situation that we're going through right now with the COVID-19. Amen? COVID-19 is not bigger than Jesus. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. So our first sign was John, was in John was Jesus turning water to wine. And we saw that Jesus was master of abundance. Amen? That he didn't just produce a little wine, he produced a lot of wine, and that it was to a very high economic value. Amen? And then we saw that he was master of creation, that you can't just turn water to wine. Now, you could turn water red, but he turned it to wine. He changed the molecular structure, so he's master of creation. And then he's master of quality, that it wasn't just wine, but the head waiter said, this is the best wine. And so we know Jesus always does everything the best. Amen. <laughs> We also saw in these miracles that generally someone's faith is increased through the miracle. So in this one, we saw that Mary had faith in Jesus because she said, I do what he says to do. And then we also saw that it said specifically, and his disciples believed in him. Now his disciples already believed because they were following, but their faith was increased and they saw Jesus as Messiah for the first time. Our second sign in John was the healing of the nobleman's son. And uh, we saw that this man approached Jesus, and Jesus kind of discouraged him with his words a little bit, but the man was faithful to keep pursuing Jesus, saying, I need you or my son's going to die. And Jesus healed that boy simply with the words, your son lives. Hallelujah. And we know the man went and uh, found uh, his, his son well. In fact, on the journey home, he met a servant coming to meet him and found out that his son was well. So hallelujah. Then uh, in that miracle, we saw that Jesus is master over sickness. So this boy had a sickness uh, that was uh, taking him towards death. <clears throat> but Jesus, with his words, healed him. We saw that Jesus master over time. There was no delay from the time Jesus spoke and the boy was healed. And that's what that, what's what that man had asked the servant when they met on the trail. He said, hey, when did uh, my son revive? And he found out it was the exact moment that Jesus spoke. And so uh, the, Jesus master over time. Jesus over master over space and distance. Jesus didn't have to go to that place with the man and lay his hands on the son. He just had to speak the word. So he's master over sickness, time, space, distance. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> and then in that, we saw that the man who was inquiring for his son, that he believed. And so he believed to come to Jesus, but then his faith was increased. And then he became a preacher. He preached to his whole family. And the Bible says his whole family believed. So hallelujah. Then in the third sign, the healing at the man at the pool, uh, there was this belief in this mystical thing of the pool that the an angel would come and touch the pool first one in would get healed and uh yeah we didn't know what that fully is uh, but at any rate this man was kind of believing in that mystical event so he was laying by the pool but he'd been in his sickness 38 years 
And it was clear that he had a sense of hopelessness because when Jesus said, do you want to be healed? He said, I have nobody to put me in the water. But Jesus said to him, well, take up your pallet and walk if you want to be healed. Hallelujah. And he did. And then also we know that that day that he did that was the Sabbath. And so that brought a conflict into the life of Jesus with the Jews over the Sabbath. But the man was healed. So we see Jesus' master over an incurable disease. For 38 years, there was no help, no relief, no healing for this man. But Jesus was able. And so if you have something that's been lingering in your life, know that Jesus is able. Amen. He's master over incurable disease and incurable situations. He's master over the Sabbath, that he's Lord of the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath is there to serve the Lord, to bring rest and refreshing to you. But it's not there for legalism to create a bunch of rules. And that's what Jesus was trying to bring forth. It's good to do good on the Sabbath. Then Jesus, I said, is a Lord or Master over folklore, superstition, mystical remedies. We have all these things in our culture, just like this man who was placed by the pool. This was some kind of mystical or a folklore kind of thing and uh, don't know if it was there was any genuine uh, truth to any of that I suspect not that it was just uh, uh, superstition but at any rate Jesus is master over all that he's greater than any uh, superstition any you know mystical magical kind of things Jesus uh, we don't need to seek those things because Jesus is the answer. Amen. And then we saw that Jesus is master over hopelessness. This man was in a hopeless state. And sometimes in life we struggle with that. And, and uh, hopelessness is like looking and saying tomorrow's not going to be better than today. We need to always look with hope. Amen. That tomorrow's going to be better t than today. Even if today's a great day, tomorrow's going to be better than today. Amen. And that's what heaven's going to be like. Every day is going to be better than the previous one. And then as far as faith increasing, we said we were a little bit uncertain about that. The man believed because he picked up his pallet and walked. But then we saw another story about him in the temple and telling the Jews that Jesus healed him. So uh, we're not sure about that man's faith if it was increased or not. But anyway, let's get into our story today. We are in John chapter 6 looking at the feeding of the 5,000. And so let's take it from the top. Let's start at verse 1 and we'll go down through uh, the verses of this story. So we start here in John chapter 6, verse 1. It says, After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. Verse 2, And a great multitude was following him, because they were seeing the signs, there's that word sign you should underline, seeing the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. So specifically the signs of miracles. And so this miracle is particular of the seven miracles which John records because it's recorded in all four Gospels. And so the stories that John picked aren't necessarily in all the other Gospels. This one is. So because of that, we see it as a very important miracle that all four Gospel writers wrote about it and that John already knew someone else had written about it and yet he still decided this is such an important miracle I have to include it in the story. So uh, we call it the feeding of the 5,000, but you know there was more than 5,000 because we'll see down in verse 10 it says it was 5,000 men, which means it was possibly 15 to 20,000 people there because we're assuming that you know there were families together with women and children. So anyway, let's go on. And we pick up there in verse 3. Let's read verse 3 down to verse 6. It says, And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover feast of the Jews was at hand. Jesus therefore, lifting up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread that these may eat? And this, this he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Yeah, that's verse 6. Isn't that verse 6 re revealing? Jesus asked him a question, <clears throat> asked Philip a question when he knew what he was going to do just to see how Philip would respond. So Jesus sees the crowds coming and he decides, hey, here's a good opportunity. Uh, when my disciples see the crowd coming and I say, man, these, we got to feed this crowd, how are my disciples going to behave? So, uh, Jesus takes opportunities that come about in life and uses them to test us. So think about that with COVID-19. 
Do you think Jesus is up in heaven saying, oh, here is a good opportunity to see how my children behave, to see how the church handles a worldwide crisis? How are we handling it, church? Are we doing well? I hope you're doing well, and I hope we as a church are doing well. So let's stay positive. Let's stay hopeful. Let's stay prayerful. Let's care for the other people in the world who have no hope, who are losing hope. Um, all their hope is resting in the medical and scientific community. All their hope is resting in the governments. All their hope is resting in uh, economic restoration. But who does our hope rest in? Our hope rests in the Lord. Amen. That means that even if everything falls apart, uh, there's a psalm that says something about, you know, though the mountains be removed and, and fall into the sea or something like that, we will remain faithful with the Lord. Amen? Because he's the one we trust in. Hallelujah. So let, let's, just, let's just read that verse uh, so I can say it to you accurately there. I think it's uh, Psalm 46. Let's take a look at that. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very pleasant help in trouble. Amen. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help even during COVID-19. Therefore, because God is our refuge, therefore we will not fear. Can you say that? Say it with me. We will not fear. Though the earth should change. Another translation say, though the earth be removed and though mountains slip into the heart of the sea. Hallelujah. We, we will not fear, church. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's be those kind of people, the people of hope, the people of strength. Amen. All right. Well, let's go back to John. Uh, we're in John chapter 6, and we're going to go to verse 7. John chapter 6 and verse 7. And it says, Philip answered him. And this is Philip's answer. 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive even a little. <laughs> and so this is the test for Philip. Philip's first up. And he attempts to calculate the problem and solve the problem with money. Do you do that? When a problem arises in your life, do you try to calculate what will it take to solve this problem and do you have the tendency to first turn to money? How much will it cost to solve this problem? Well, we all have that tendency, but I want to encourage you, church. Let's be the kind of per people that first take it to Jesus. Amen. Jesus, there's a problem. Help me have wisdom. As we're talking about wisdom and offering, help me have wisdom, Lord, to solve this problem. Or Jesus, would you come and solve this problem? Hallelujah. So let's not be those. So he calculates 200 denarii. Uh, a denarii is about a day's wage. So he's saying about 200 days wages. I don't know where he got that number from. Maybe it's just a round number they used a lot. Uh, but I think it was maybe how much money they actually had with them. And so Philip was proposing, hey, we looked in our accounting and we've got 200 denarii. So if we spend all that we have, it's not enough for everyone to have, just have a little bit. It's certainly not going to feed them. Um, and, and so Philip was being negative. Are you negative when there's a problem? Let's not be negative, amen? Let's be the people of hope, hallelujah. So Philip failed the test. Have you ever failed a test with the Lord? Yeah, you know, we all fail, but here's the good news. We get to take the test again. <laughs> with Jesus, there's really no failures. You just get to do it again. So Philip failed, and so next up is Andrew. So let's read that in verse eight. So John chapter six, verse eight, and one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. Uh, but what are these for so many? So he had faith, but he also had a little wavering faith. He brought something to Jesus, but then said, mm, It's not very much. Not sure you could do anything with, Jesus, <laughs> with this Jesus. And so... Uh, Philip was a statistical pessimist, and Andrew was an ingenious optimist. He said, hey, here's something we could use. Here's some five barley loaves and two fishes. And then when he looked at the size of the problem, he said, like, oh, well, I'm not sure that's gonna, not going to do anything. So this is a key verse because God 
uh, likes to use something. Amen. Sometimes we are wanting God to do something with nothing. And of course, God can do that in creation. He spoke the worlds into existence out of nothing. But we see a lot in the Bible where God likes to do something with something. So when they needed wine, he didn't just make it like rain wine, but he got water and then changed the water into wine. When he needs to feed the 5,000, he didn't just, again, cause food to appear, but he starts with something. And so he starts with five loaves and two fish. So even if what your problem needs and what you have don't match up, Jesus is able. Amen. You might be like Philip and you calculate, oh, this problem is so large and the amount of money is not enough. But if you take whatever you have to Jesus, he can make it be enough to meet the need. Amen. And so let's go on in our story. Verse 10. Hallelujah. Verse 10. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in this place, so the men sat down in number of about 5,000. Again, they just recorded the men, so with women and children, it's probably 15 to 20,000 people there. Verse 11, Jesus therefore took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, and look at this last line, as much as they wanted. Somebody say hallelujah, as much as they wanted. So that's an incredible point that John adds in. He could have just said Jesus fed them, but as Jesus fed them, he gave them as much as they wanted. And so what John is trying to highlight for us here is that Jesus is master of quantity. Even when he did a miracle, he didn't say, hey, here's one fish sandwich for you. That's enough. No, if there's a big boy there and he says, I need two fish sandwiches, I need three fish sandwiches, <laughs> Jesus would say, well, fine, here's, here's three loaves, here's you know, three pieces of fish, and uh, you go at it. You have all that you want. And so God's a good God. Amen. He wants to bless. Sometimes we think like God's somehow kind of stingy, but he's not. Uh, the Bible says he reigns on the just and the unjust. He has given our world enough resources for every person that's here. Now, there's a conflict in the world, right, that everyone's not getting their fair share. And, and in the systems that try and do that, like co uh, communism and socialism, don't seem to be effective either uh, because the world is imbalanced because of sin. But it's balanced in its creation that Jesus has created enough for every person. And so that's what he's showing in this miracle, that he's master of quantity and there's enough for everyone. And there's enough resources in the world for everyone. So I want to encourage you, if you don't have enough, to call upon the Lord. He's able to meet your needs and even exceed your needs. Hallelujah. And so when this miracle took place, it doesn't tell us how it did it, but knowing Jesus and knowing uh, the miracle of water to wine and other things he's done, I believe that every time he broke a loaf in half, the loaf grew into a whole loaf. Every time he broke a fish in half, there was a whole fish. And I don't know if it was that way, but I imagine it was that way because he always starts with something. Amen? <laughs> So Jesus always starts with something. So I believe every time he was breaking off the, the bread and the fish, they were just growing. They were just reproducing themselves. Let's go on to verse 12. It says, and when they were filled, so they ate all they wanted, full bellies. He said to his disciple, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So here's a good principle for us that Jesus says, don't be wasteful. Don't just leave all the bread and stuff laying around the field. Let's pick up everything that's left over. And so he gathered it up and it says there was 12 baskets full. And so I would encourage you, uh, we can sometimes be wasteful people. I know that. And we need to try and watch that in our lives. I remember growing up, my dad would always say, uh, take as much as you want, but eat what you take. Amen. Take what you want, but eat what you take. And so even to this day, it's hard for me to leave food on the plate. Sometimes I'm full and there's food on the plate, but I just keep eating till my plate's empty because that's kind of a principle I grew up with. And I want to encourage you in that too, not to, not to over eat, but, <laughs> but you know, to have that principle where we don't waste. All right, verse 13. And so they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments from the five barley loaves, which were left over from those who had eaten. And so it doesn't say what they did with it, but I'm assuming they gave it back to uh, the little boy. Amen. Uh, to bless him. To, he gave his, and so he's giving it back to him. You know, when we give to Jesus, uh, he always gives back to us. Amen. You'll be blessed with more. Hallelujah. Verse 14. 
When therefore the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is of a truth, the prophet who has come into the world. And so we're talking about from each miracle who believes. So we see in this, the crowd believed. Uh, they believed he was the prophet. I think they're referring to Messiah, uh, that, one, that, that the Lord would raise up a prophet like unto Moses who would be Messiah. I believe that's what they're referring to. Uh, all right, well, let's close. I want to read a couple more verses to you in closing. And so let's look at verse 15. In verse 15, Jesus therefore perceived that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, and he withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. So from this miracle, the people were like, man, this is the greatest guy. He gives us food for free. Let's make him king. But Jesus wasn't here on earth to be king because he's king of kings. Amen. He wasn't here to be king of Israel. He's here to be king of the universe. He's, he's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And so he's like, no, 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 you're missing it. Don't, don't make me king. <laughs> and so he, he slips away. And then let's jump over to verses 26 and 27. It says, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the sign, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give you. For on him the Father, even God, has set his seal. Wow. So some great verses there. I just wanted to highlight to you because what Jesus saw was these people were pursuing Jesus for what Jesus could do for them. This is one of the problems with the prosperity message that we get into. We believe that the Bible teaches prosperity for the follower of Jesus, but we don't want to follow Jesus for prosperity. Amen? And so uh, that's what these people were doing. They were following Jesus and wanting to make him king because he was healing the sick and because he was feeding these, this, this crowd of people. So they saw that this Messiah and he's going to bless Israel and this is what they wanted. And they didn't really want to draw closer to God. And that's what Jesus wants. Amen. So we have to remember that even in our own lives, that as we pursue Jesus, as we pursue to know him, we want to know him. We want to grow close to him. We want to grow deeper in righteousness. We want to grow deeper in forsaking sin and pursuing holiness. Amen. <laughs> we don't want to just pursue the blessings. We need to see the blessings as kind of a, a byproduct, a side product. It's part of being in the family. Um, I, I am blessed and so my kids are blessed. It's part of being in the family. I bless my kids. I help them. Any of them have a crisis comes up. I'm going to come to their assistance and help them. But it's not why they're in the family. And they should want to know me as their papa and draw close to me as their papa to know me and to spend time with me and to fellowship with me and to do things that are pleasing to, to me, right? To live their lives in a way that pleases me. But they shouldn't just pursue me so that they get blessings. And so it is with our Father in heaven. Let's not pursue the blessings. Let's pursue the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. Well, Jesus in this story is shown to us that he is master over quantity. He fed fifteen to 20,000 people and had 12 baskets left over. Uh, that we trust he gave to the little boy. <laughs> so he's master of quantity. He's master of natural laws. Bread and fish don't just multiply when they're in a basket or when you break them. It, it just does, they don't multiply that way. And so he's master over natural laws. He's master over statistical impossibilities because Philip said, if we take all of our money and buy bread, it's not enough bread for all these people. Uh, Philip was one of those who figured it all out. He calculated it and he said, this problem can't be solved, but it can be solved with Jesus. Amen. <laughs> so as we close today, I just want to say, what in your life is a statistical impossibility? Maybe you look at your wage and you say, at this wage, even if I work for a thousand years, I'll never have enough money to meet this need or to buy a house or do whatever it is your dream is to do. Well, give it to Jesus. Amen. He's able. He's able. He's able to bless you and help you. But what in your life is a statistical impossibility? Would you give it to Jesus today and trust him that he's able? Uh, we've seen so far in the miracles that we have looked at that Jesus is master of abundance. He's master of creation. He's master of quality. He's master over sickness. He's master over time, space, and distance. He's master over incurable diseases. He's master over the Sabbath. 
He's master over folklore, or superstition, or mystical remedies. <laughs> he's master over hopelessness. And he's master over quantity and natural laws and statistical impossibilities. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today and thank you for each one that's watching. And I want to pray especially for those right now that have a problem in their life. And like Philip, they've already calculated it out. They've sat down they with pen and pencil or done it in their mind and they've said, this is impossible. There's not enough money. If I work all my days, I'll never be able to pay this medical bill or I'll never be able to buy the house or I'll never be able to have this kind of life. But God, we thank you that you show us today that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. That when we say, oh, 200 days wage wouldn't even give these people a good meal. That you're able to take a little boy's lunch, five, five little pieces of bread and two little fish and feed a multitude, 15 to 20,000 people. Jesus, thank you for this sign. And I pray that everyone watching right now, their faith increases. And again, Father, especially those who are facing, uh, facing problems that they have found statistically impossible to solve on their own. Jesus, be the answer today. Be the answer today in their lives. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, as we close today, would you say the benediction with me? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being with us. Be with us next Sunday when we're going to look at the next sign, which is Jesus walking on water. And we know Peter got out of the boat, walked on water for a little while too, so it's going to be a fun sermon, so check that out next week. Until then, have a great day today and have a great week in the Lord. God bless you. Bye-bye.